What's up, everybody? It's Miles Turner, the Indiana Pacers. You're listening to the Pace Rules Podcast. Be sure to follow at Pace Rules on Twitter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pace Rules Podcast, the only Australian NBA podcast with the bias towards the Indiana Pacers. And the bubble Pacers are in full effect, 3-0 and in Orlando. Today, we're going to talk about the Washington and Orlando back-to-back with some back-to-back performances by TJ Warren that put him in historic company um, Alex, you uh, you tweeted out a couple of uh, a couple of photos and some stats. Justin, you've been active on uh, on Twitter over the last few days. Uh, it's been a it's been a good couple of days to be a uh, a Pacers fan, hasn't it, Alex? Mate, it's been absolutely fantastic. Obviously, you know we've talked about it. How good is it to have the NBA back? But now I I did not expect this at all. Obviously, no Domas. You know, Victor Oladipo was questionable. So a week ago, we were talking about how depressed we were. And, you know, if Vic doesn't play, we're, we're all going to be doom and gloom. But here we are, TJ Warren. You know, he's but he turned into Michael Jordan 2.0 here, hasn't he? So <laughs> it's a great time to be a Pacers fan. And, you know, just as predicted, he we rested Vic, obviously, for one of the two games. But it didn't matter, did it, Justin? Because we've got, you know, future, future all-star on the floor leading us in scoring each and every night. This is what Pacers fans have been crying out for, for help with Victor Oladipo. This is the TJ Warren we, uh, we hoped that we would see. Yeah, yeah, you're definitely right. And you're right by saying record-breaking three games. Like, I think he tied Jermaine O'Neal for 119 points in a three-game span, which is... Um, pretty insane. incredible from a crazy from pace, yeah, it's perspective. Uh, definitely coming into this Orlando bubble with you know the rust and a different situation for him to tie that record is pretty incredible. So yeah, it's funny like watching the games. I haven't even like thought of Victor and how he's doing. It's all about you know get the ball to TJ and get out the way. Um, you know he's hitting some incredible shots and turnaround fadeaways. He's, he's cutting. He's you know his three point percentage is off the off the charts. He's He's like a knockdown three-point shooter now. You can you can definitely tell um, when the season was locked down who was working, and you can tell TJ Warren was obviously the hardest worker. Well, they did say on the telecast that he sort of lives in the gym, and he found it hard to find gyms in in the like early phases of coronavirus. But he he was able to find a few that were open and and stay stay ready. Um, I guess he would say and. And hasn't he? Like, it's just been an incredible scoring performance. As you say, he's been scoring at sort of all three levels. He's been getting to the line. He's been hitting crazy shots. I think Orlando really challenged him in the second half today. Uh, They trapped him. They doubled him. They put Aaron Gordon on him for most of the second half. But, you know, in in some parts, he he had to adapt to that. But overall, it didn't matter. Like, he was still uh, the best player on the floor yesterday and today against Washington and against Orlando. Um, Three-point shooting has been obviously uh, a feature of his game that we've been crying out for since very, very early in the Pacerous and wanting him to be more consistent from there. And uh, Alex, how, how good is it to sort of have that um, that guy that can score from anywhere back on the team? Uh, Vic's obviously had that talent before the injury, uh, hasn't quite got back to that level yet, but this is the sort of talent you need to be able to win playoff series, isn't it? Yeah, well, I was actually just going to say I've got to give credit to Vic because a lot of guys, especially All-Stars, when they come back, it's, it's at the end of the day, this is like still Victor Oladipo's team, right? A lot of guys, when they come back, would not be willing to take the back seat, would not be willing to sit there and go, you know what? This guy's got the hot hand. I'm going to take, you know, six or seven shots today and maybe put up 12 points, but I don't care. That's what Victor Oladipo has done this past week. So quickly shout out to him. But yeah, you mentioned it. I mean, Magic actually did a pretty good job, especially in that... uh that third term, but yep. <laughs> it just does not matter, does it? He <laughs> he gets it any which way possible, and he just knows how to get buckets. Like Even if they're double teaming him, you know, he'll pass the ball and then backdoor cut for an open layup, or he just find ways to get around the defense. And, you know, I, I talked about it on the last episode. I, I, did, I, I That 53-point performance was the best thing I've ever seen from an individual standpoint. I don't think I've seen a better stretch from a Pacers player, maybe ever. No, I agree. I think even even the Paul George years, we didn't have a stretch like this, a three-game stretch where he was just scoring at will in this fashion. I think he showed flashes of having big games and stuff, but um, but never a, an experience like this. And I think the, the Orlando bubble plays into that a little bit and makes it uh, a little bit easier to be able to compartmentalize because it's happened, you know, all in the same week and all in the same place. And you know, it's it's sort of one grouping of games. I mean, if there was an MVP award 
for Orlando alone, Justin, for these uh, these seeding games, there's a clear favourite, isn't there? Well, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. I'm just watching the Houston-Portland game today and Stan Van Gundy just mentioned that. <laughs> TJ Warren's basically got the MVP bubble award locked down and, you know, three of eight games in, unless he, you know, goes through a terrible stretch, you reckon TJ Warren would be awarded that made-up uh, award. My, my only question is, I think, obviously, TJ's going to, going to go hard against Phoenix and I know I'm looking a bit far ahead but um, I think his biggest test comes against Lakers and that's going to be on the weekend to say or to really show you know if he can do it against the big boys you you don't think LeBron has seen all this you don't think they're going to Lakers are going to come out and say hey this guy's on a tear right now let's let's try and stop him so I'm all eyes on that Lakers matchup on Saturday in Australia. You might be all eyes on the Lakers matchup but I'm all eyes on the Heat's matchup. I, I look to be to be frank. If we don't beat the Lakers, but if we beat the Heat twice, um, I'll take it every day of the week. And yeah. I, the the Lakers game means a whole lot less for right now because um, because of how much I dislike Miami. Um, I, I really really want to see TJ continue this form against Jimmy Butler, who rested today because uh, he needed he needed a little bit of a sleep in Jimmy. He was need a little bit more rest. Fair enough. He's getting old. He's not scoring as many points as TJ. So um, I, I just I can't wait for the Miami game. I I hope and pray that we beat Miami. It's it's I've wanted it more than uh, than any other playoff series in recent memory. Memory and it's looking like there's no real avoiding Miami in the first round. Alex, it's pretty much a locked lock that we face Miami, isn't it? And I would not have it any other way. Honestly, yep. I think. I think all Pacers fans are in agreement there. We haven't, we didn't beat them back in 2012, back in 2013, 2014. We want revenge. I don't care if it's a different team. I don't care if none of the players are the same. It's still that same rivalry coming back. So, yeah, well, I think you know. I think the whole NBA would want it because Pacers yeah. uh, Miami have a good rivalry, and so do Philadelphia and Boston. So yep, that's true. That, you know, Philly and Boston fans hate each other, and you know those teams has had a rivalry for years. So I think that uh, three, six, and four, five matchup, everyone, including the NBA, would want Pacers Miami and Philly versus Boston. And just want just want to run something past you guys. It, it has been three games, but starting to see a bit of chatter about how good the Pacers' offense has been without Sabonis. Now, personally, I'm not reading too much into it. Three games and Sabonis has probably been our best performer all year. But what do you you guys think about that? Two points I'd like to make. Firstly, we've played no one to this point. Like, Philly aside, um, Philly Philly have... Uh, really bad chemistry for some reason and a, and a thoroughly un, underperforming. That was an impressive win. But the other two games have been against teams that are either fringe playoff or not in the playoffs at all. So I just take it with a grain of salt in terms of how good we've looked on the offensive end, um, mostly because of our um, who we've played. If we can execute that well against the Lakers and the Heat, then I'll believe it. But... Uh, I think I need to see it consistently against good opposition before I can believe that it's not just down to who we're playing and and poor D. That said, our execution has been fantastic, and Nate McMillan and his team should be um, should be praised for that. Um, the other side of it is that we knew that having two big men coming into this season was going to be a weird look. It was going to be zagging when the rest of the league is zigging, and this kind of shows me that it might be better to have a more traditional and by traditional, I mean new traditional lineup of one big man on the floor at all times, because it just results in better offense. Um, And it just means, I think that the decision that we have to make might be coming a little sooner than we'd like it to be. Um, Alex, is it inevitable that we've got to trade one of these guys? I don't know. It's so tough to say, man, because obviously like we love them both, but like Justin, I think you touched on it. The offense has been incredible these last three games. And I know, again, we've played some pretty underperforming teams. Don't get me wrong. But I will also add that you can see Domas's or the impact that Domas's absence is having on Doug McDermott and Justin Holley more than anyone. Yeah. Doug McDermott has not hit a single three in the first three games. That's He, he was shooting, what, 40-something percent this year? Justin Holley, he's only hit two threes. So... You know, we, we can talk about how well, you know, guys are playing, like Aaron's playing well. 
Vicks look good, Warren's look good, but at the same time, his impact is still lost, not only on the rebounds, but on the second unit, like incredibly. Yeah, we're stretched and it's clear that we're one all-star short or we're one, you know, starter short. So, you know, Justin, I think the the question that will come and the question that will be asked more and more, especially if the, the team plays a lot better, is uh, are we better off having another wing than one of our two big men? Yeah, I, I, it's very interesting. And I just wanted to bring it up to get both your opinions because I'm of the same, you know, thinkings of you guys. But... Um, also, I think we've got to remember if TJ Warren wasn't going on this explosion, we could be 0-3. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's true. Um, yeah. yeah, I think people... Oh, it hasn't been a major topic, but some people maybe just got to cool their, cool their um, jets on the Sabonis talk. I think, like you, Adam, it's, it's going to come down to the playoffs, how we perform in the playoffs. It doesn't look like Sabonis may be back the rest of the year. Um, I, unless we make it to the second round, it looks like he's out for the foreseeable future. So... It's going to be interesting. But, yeah, it's uh, it's great to see Miles be aggressive and, um, you know, TJ is just absolutely dominating. So, you know, Sabonis being out, it's kind of that next man up mentality that Pacers always have and some guys are really succeeding. But then again, like you mentioned, Alex, uh, Justin Holiday and Doug McDermott are really struggling. And, and, you know, some great threes by Miles today. We saw him be more aggressive from outside. And, um, Alex, you, you tweeted, obviously, there's only a couple of players in the league that could do one of the moves that that he made um, and, you know, Miles actually retweeted that quickly after. And, and I've, I've upset you. Twitter. You I've have, upset, you have upset I've upset Twitter. a lot of Twitter. Yeah. Why? What happened? What, what were they saying? Oh, because I said that, you know, only a couple of other centers yeah. could do that. So they're going to come in with, you know, listing. Who, who are the centers? Some that people they? were listing MB. I'm like, MB doesn't, well, what, are you shooting like 27 percent from three? What are you talking about? MB doesn't do well, that. Who were a couple of the others? What, Jokic? Like Aaron Baines. Um, People were listing. I don't know. Just like oh, the only Anthony ones Towns. that can do that on the re- yeah. Cat, I agree with one. Yeah, yeah. And maybe and Lopez as well. They were my two. But anyway, it is what it is. Yeah, there's there's uh, when whenever you try and praise Miles for for good offensive play, you'll get a lot of people saying that he does things that other players do, but they clearly don't really watch that closely. But I mean, the, the the package is the thing that's impressive. Um, it's not just that he. Uh, pulled that three and was able to to pull that offensive move but it's the blocks that he gets on the other end it's the defensive pressure that he applies it's the you know the being able to guard a player out in the perimeter on a switch um, on a spot possession if he needs to like the the total package of of defense and his ability to uh, to execute in the offensive end and, and it was always going to be a great opportunity for him to be able to show off that skill and it's it's really good to see that that's happening um look it wouldn't be a pace for his podcast if i didn't talk about aaron holiday so i uh, i think uh, i need to uh, i just i just want to run you through his last two games against washington 17 points two rebounds two assists a steal a block uh against orlando uh he had 12 points four rebounds four assists um so look i all i want to say is that that's what we would expect out of him. It's not, it didn't impress me. It didn't make me think, wow, what a great player. That is my expectation for Aaron Holiday moving forward. That is what I want to see out of him consistently. I want to see double digit scoring. I want to see, you know, uh, around four or five assists. I want to see a couple of rebounds. I want to see a couple of threes. That is the game that we need out of him for us to be successful. I'm not saying he's great or he's better than anyone thinks he is, but what I am saying is that that is what he needs to do, Justin, to justify his place on the team. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's the perfect summary. There's, there's either, you know, you're either on one fence or one side or the other about Aaron Holiday. I'm obviously on one side, but, you know, what he's done the last two games has been terrific. I actually don't mind him running point with Brogdon off the ball the last two games. Kind of opens things up. Although Brogdon hasn't been hitting his shots, he's been open and it kind of opens things up and, like I mentioned on my last episode, I really like when Aaron goes to the hoop. You know, he doesn't settle for these long contested threes. Um, one thing I can tell about Aaron is, you know, he really cares about his performance. Yeah. And I'm saying that in a positive manner where I, I would be 99.9% sure he'd be checking the box score straight after the game. And he knows he has to perform because this is his big opportunity with Vic yeah. being, you know, 50% with Jeremy Lamb out, with Sabonis out. There's, 
what, 20, 30 extra shots to go around. Um, and he's starting. So this is his big chance probably in the NBA to prove he's an NBA calibre uh, player. Yeah, he's going to take 10 to 15 shots a game for the rest of the way. And it's going to be a measure of how he is able to consistently produce those double-digit scoring nights with the assists, with a couple of steals, with threes, and be versatile enough to be able to say, not only do I belong in this league, but I'm going to make a difference in a playoff series. I'm going to make a difference out there on the floor at the end of games. Um, Alex, how important is it that Aaron Holiday takes advantage of the opportunity he's got before him the next month? Incredibly, man. You know, we've talked about that again on the last few episodes. Him and Miles have the biggest opportunity to step up in these next, not just the next, you know, five games for the regular season, but if Domas is out for the playoffs, they've got the biggest opportunity to step up and say, you know what? We don't just belong on this team, but we are necessity to this yep. franchise if you want to win. So, you know, and yeah, Aaron's played really well. I was actually really concerned because he played pretty poorly in the last two scrimmages. Didn't look like he fit in with that starting lineup, man, but he's turned it around on his on his head. So, and Justin talked about it. He's not settling anymore. He's actually going to the hoop. He's, you know, feeling contact and finishing strong. So he's been nothing short of impressive. Yeah, he has. And as you say, it's interesting to see Justin and Doug struggle when um, those were two of the more reliable players um, on the floor. And, and Aaron has been one of the most inconsistent paces and he's mm. actually been one of the more reliable ones um, yeah. in Orlando. Um, I, I want to talk about Malcolm Brogdon because uh, it's something that you guys, uh, we all talked about while the game was going on today, that um, it, it appears that he's struggling to be able to find a rhythm to this point. He's had a lot of inconsistency with being in and out of the team. He, you know, It's been well documented that he's had a lot of um, freak injuries to different body parts. And he obviously suffered from coronavirus earlier in the year, which is terrible. And you know, he, he's clearly not necessarily anywhere near his best at this point. I think he's, he's trying to get back into game shape, I would say, because he, it doesn't look like the game is coming as naturally to him as it did earlier in the season. Justin, are you worried about this? Or do you think it's just a matter of, you know, the eight scrimmage games will give him the opportunity to find that game shape? No, I am worried. Um, because even coming into the bubble, he was a bit up and down as well. So it's not like, oh, you know, he's only had two games back. Um, there were some concerning things. Like he's just, I think, Jeremiah Johnson tweeted he's had eight or nine different injuries this year, um, which is a whole other subplot. But um, I messaged you guys during the game and said, you know, I'm going to find it really hard right now to grade Malcolm Brogdon's season. I'd, I don't know. I'd put it as a B minus right now, maybe um, C plus. But um, it's going to come down to the playoffs. If he performs in the playoffs, well, he had a good year. Um, you know, if he doesn't do too well, you'd say maybe, you know, he struggled this year through injury and everything like that. And it's going to be interesting um, if he does play off the ball more with Aaron running the point or, you know, we give Brogdon um, the ball to, to create. My, my big thing, and I, I trust Malcolm Brogdon in the clutch, which is really good. You know, some players, when they've got the ball in the fourth quarter of a close game, you're tart in the mouth kind of stuff, uh, kind of like Land Stevenson. Yep. Um, but... Yeah, Brogdon does come through with big plays. And I just want to mention, I mean, we spoke about it. We, he's like a 90% free throw shooter, but he's like the worst 90% free throw shooter now. I swear, <laughs> yeah. I swear he misses every second one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's been very uh, inconsistent. Well, yeah, what, what do you think, Alex? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a funny point you mentioned because today he missed like two or three. And I was like, what the hell is happening, man? And you talk about the season in whole. He started as a, he was playing all star basketball at the start of the year. He was dropping, you know, 30 and 12. And maybe some of the, the problems he's had later in the season are because of injuries. Probably, you know, a lot of them, it's not his fault. But at the same time, we talk a lot about Aaron Holiday's inconsistencies on the show. Brogdon's had them as well. And that's probably worse considering, you know, he's your starter. He's your, he's the captain. He's the leader of the team. He's running the team. So it's been pretty disappointing. And he's, He's missing easy shots as well. Like I've seen him miss shots at the rim that you know I've never seen him miss before. He's missing wide open threes. So yeah, hopefully he turns it around. But it's definitely a concerning thing right now. Well, I think we're gonna know in a month. Obviously, well, when the season's over, we'll make our assumptions. But even halfway through the playoffs, um, even if, we, if Pacers don't get out the first round, I think you know a lot's gonna be told. Where we could be sitting here saying, "Wow, T.J. Warren was our best performer this year." 
or yeah. geez, Malcolm Brogdon struggled this year or, oh, wow, we needed Sabonis in the playoffs. There's so many storylines that are going to be told within the next month. Every one of our starters has a different sort of storyline attached to them this season. And, and they're all, you know, significant and they've all gone through trials and tribulations in their own way. But the, the consistent rock has been TJ Warren. Um, you know, Miles has had inconsistency. Domas is now injured. Brogdon's been in and out. Vix is well documented. TJ Warren's just been there from the get go, just getting buckets every single game, consistently getting buckets. And, and you know, that's a that's a, a professional, mature player that you want on your team. Nothing take nothing away from any of the other guys because a lot of them suffered from unforeseen circumstances, specifically injury, change roles, that sort of stuff. There's been a lot of adversity that this team's had to overcome, and I don't think enough is probably made of that. Um, whereas TJ Warren's just been rock solid um, this whole season. He's, uh, well, he's been I, fantastic. I think we're going to put a challenge down. If I reckon if he scores 40-plus against the Suns, we have to buy a TJ Warren jersey. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I yeah. agree. I'm down. Yep. Down. Yep. All, all agreed upon because that will be 160 points in four games and that is deserving of an Australian. And I just want to add in as well, he is shooting an insanely efficient... He's not just putting up good points. Yeah. He's shooting over 60% from the field and over 60% from three. Crazy, yeah. that It's actually unheard of. It's Alex, unbelievable. And we know that we, we're now going to buy a TJ Warren jersey if he puts up 40 <laughs> against the Suns. Are you going to buy every TJ Warren jersey if he dunks on Ricky Rubio? <laughs> if he... No, I'm going to tell you what. This is, I'm going to call it right now. It's going to be a close game. They're going to switch Rubio on to Warren. Last second, he's going to ankle break him to the ground and knock a three down in someone's face. And that... When that happens, I'll order the entire city of uh, Indianapolis a TJ Warren jersey. Wow. Sounds, well, you've heard it here sounds first. A like, sounds a lot like what Devin Booker did to Paul George today. We. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. We, some, um, shade, some shade throw. Some shade. So it's just a little bit. Play, we'll oh, see if oh, Playoff P like, shows up next month. Paul, Paul George is, you know, no, no hate, but he's becoming the poster boy for people to hit game winners on. Yeah, you know, oh, that's got, true. Yeah, you got Lillard, you got Booker. It's uh, it's actually as a Pacer fan, it's quite humorous. <laughs> and the great irony is that Paul George is actually putting up really good numbers in Orlando, but uh, yeah. but the the downside of that is that he surrenders game winners to really good shooters. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah. He, he he would have said that Booker was a uh, Booker's shot was a bad shot as well. Yeah, it was a bad <laughs> shot. It was a bad shot. Oh, yeah, should should have given it up to uh, Aaron Baines to hit the shot. Yeah. Um. All right, guys, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. We've got, obviously, a couple of games coming up. So before we go, we'll preview uh, the next one. Um, we've obviously had Washington, we've had Orlando, and we've had Philadelphia. We have Phoenix. Um, aside from Devin Booker, is there anyone else you're concerned about on that Phoenix team? I think Mikael Bridges is going to give TJ Warren some problems, man. Yeah. I think he's an elite defender, really underrated, so... I think it's going to be a massive test. He played well. He played really well against the Suns earlier in the year, but yeah, this is going to be a big test. He's going to face double teams. He's going to face their best defenders. So I'm excited to see if he can uh, adver- face the adversity and uh, come up with another big performance. Justin, yeah, I mean Phoenix are three and zero as well. Yeah. So you know they're no slouch. They're they're playing hard. Obviously, Devin Booker is incredible. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the same as Alex. You know, Phoenix will probably go hard at TJ Warren, knowing all the chatter. You know, which is made national attention sports centers comment on it a bleacher report even espn's you know mentioned oh cash considerations like this has gone viral so don't underestimate phoenix you know being fired up for this game um yeah, yeah i can't wait yeah i think the the interesting one for me is the man in the middle deandre ayton versus miles turner i think um with with ayton's ability to be able to grab rebounds um i think miles is going to have his hands full he's very physical sort of a center he's, he's quite skilled so i'm interested to see how that big man matchup works out with miles versus ayton uh, i think miles has got the opportunity to to show that he's a veteran that can outpoint the younger um the younger gun uh, so it should be a great game regardless. But I think uh, we're going to bring you another episode after that Phoenix Suns game. We'll either be uh, talking up TJ Warren again or, uh, or ordering TJ Warren jerseys live uh, on the air as we record. Um, we also want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for following us on Twitter. We now uh, have surpassed 1,000 followers, which is a great milestone for us for... As we keep saying, three random guys from Melbourne that love the Pacers uh, starting a podcast last August. And, uh, you know, it's coming up to a year now and we've been able to 
uh, amass uh, some really consistent listenership and a thousand followers. It's been uh, more than we ever could have hoped for, Justin, isn't it? Yeah, it's incredible. Um, shout out to all Pace Nation. You guys have been so supportive. I think I really haven't read one negative tweet about the podcast. Everyone loves it. You know, we, we get screenshots of people listening to it on the way to work. People who aren't even basketball fans tune in. Um, you know, we had the feedback early on. It might be too much of a niche podcast from Australia, just talking about, the, you know, small Indiana paces. But, um, yeah, fans have been terrific. Um, we've hopefully got some things in store in the near future. Um, but, yeah, thank you to all the fans. Yeah, Alex, you, you're obviously used to this kind of attention because you're super popular. But, um, yeah, it's pretty awesome how well the podcast has done over the last year. It's uh, got to make you pretty proud. Yeah, it's humbling, man. I think, like, I, I really had no expectations. I thought if we got, you know, a couple hundred followers and some regular listeners, that would be enough for me. But to have, you know, over a thousand people follow us, and as Justin mentioned, I get people DMing me all the time on, you know, Instagram and Twitter saying, we appreciate you keeping it real. We appreciate, you know, you uh, you guys talking about the stuff you do. So, you know, it means a lot to get that sort of interaction. It means a lot that people listen to us because we don't, I feel like I don't really know that much more than a lot of people, but, you know, it's just, it's a fun thing knowing that there's people around the world that actually care about what you say. Yeah, it's super fun. And, and I think the, uh, the key is that we support a club that's very community focused, very inclusive and, um, you know, has embraced us with open arms. So we want just want to thank all the fans. We want to thank uh, the guys that work for Fox Sports Indiana that have come on the podcast and, uh, and Paces Radio, et cetera. Um, you know, great supporters of the show and we'll continue to, to, to engage you for as, uh, as long as there is an Indiana Pacers basketball team. Guys, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. This has been the Paceroos. Uh, the tension turns to the Suns. Let's beat Phoenix for TJ. Mm-hmm.